Welcome to the 2024 draft prep season here at the Beat the Shift podcast presented by Fangraphs. Each week on the show, we'll get you prepped with game theory and strategy, highlight undervalued players, talking with the best guests from around the industry. On our first episode of 2024, Frank Stample of CBS Sports and the Fantasy Baseball Today podcast joins us as we navigate you through the first two rounds of ADP from early season drafting. Plus, we'll have injury report, trivia, listener mailbag, and more. That's all coming up next here on Beat the Shift. And welcome to another episode of the Beat the Shift Podcast. I am your host, Ariel Cohen, and with me as always is Ruben Guy. How are you, Ruben? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. It's been a little while since we've done a show, and uh, we are set now in our busy draft prep mode. ATC projections are churning every single day and every single night to get you guys the best numbers. What are we up to, Ruben? Uh, not much. Just enjoying the holiday, enjoy the holiday season, and resting up for the draft season, which is upon us now. Yeah, can't wait. And it's already January, mid January. We'll be drafting. Some of you are even drafting now. Um, so uh, we got to get you up to speed. Uh, so today is going to be our first and second rounds episode. We're going to talk a little bit about some strategy, about first couple of rounds, a little bit about risk, a little bit about. Uh, uh, Banking on consistency and uh, just, you know, setting yourself up well for the end of the draft. So with us today, we've got a fantastic guest from the CBS Baseball Today podcast. Welcome our good friend, Frank Stamfel. How are you? I'm doing well, Ariel. It's, I'm happy to be here. Uh, what's going on, Ruvain Guy? I have this image in my head of when we were all out at First Pitch Arizona, the AFL Home Run Derby, Ruvain Guy diving on the floor and snagging a home run ball. So that's that's not, my lasting memory. Not not the most graceful of pictures, but yes, I I I I've had to fend off a couple of young children. Yes, I did that. Um, but but I did I did bring it home. I gave it to my son, so there's a reason why I did that. And you know, I it all's well that ends well. Well, I I remember this lady who's sit, lying literally lying down on the floor with a blanket, and there's you know a hundred people swarming around her, and she's yelling at everybody, "Get off me!" What do you think's gonna happen? Balls are flying here, lady. Yeah, seriously. I mean, read the room. Like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Good times. Good times, guys. All right. Well, we've got a lot of work to do on our uh, first set and second rounds. We're going to talk a little bit strategy. And just to open up the draft season, just wanted to get your uh, take and some insight and helpful pointers, uh, Frank, on draft preparation in terms of uh, preparing for a fantasy baseball draft. And just want to ask you, you know, what tools and resources do you recommend people – study, look at, read, use um, in preparing for their fan upcoming fantasy baseball drafts? All right. Well, the easy answer is to obviously listen to fantasy baseball today and beat the shift, right? Yeah. So yes. we'll start there. That's what everyone should be doing. <laughs> um, but for me, it's a, a bunch of different outlets. The ones that I use most are going to be fan graphs. I mean, you should see my computer at all times in the off season, during the season, I have a million tabs open, um, and really most of them are usually come from fan graphs. Uh, that's my go-to. You can find almost any possible stat that you're looking for, anything that you've heard on a podcast before, uh, any of these pitching peripheral numbers, uh, you know, FIP, XFIP, Sierra, anything that you're looking for, any kind of like advanced, um, but even service level stats like fan graphs is usually my go-to. Uh, that's kind of like the starting point. Uh, I also use baseball savant for stat cast data. I use the NFBC for ADP data as well. What's really unique about NFBC and, you know, tracking ADP is that you can sort it by certain time frames. So it's really interesting to what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at ADP month by month and kind of compare and contrast. I'll download them, you know, throw them in an Excel sheet and look, all right, who's moving up the most over the, the past month, who's moving down. So that's a really useful tool just to try and get an idea for just draft trends, which players are on the rise, which players are, are falling. Um, but yeah, it's really all of those things in conjunction, uh, using them together. I'm, 
you know, I have this Google Doc all off season that I continue to update. That's right now it's nearly a hundred pages long where I'm just constantly taking notes on players. Anything that I find interesting, a stat that pops up, hearing something on a podcast, whatever it might be, I just have this huge long running doc. And I guess that's kind of like where my preparation for the off season starts. And, you know, that's a lot of just me doing my podcast and, uh, you know, the notes that I take for that podcast and just constantly adding to that sheet. But again, it's going back to all of those different resources that I mentioned before, those those different websites. And Frank is a uh, fantastic fantasy baseball player, so definitely listen to what he has to say there. Um, I, I use very similar sites. I use all those, Fangraphs, NFBC for ADP. I used to use a site for ADP called Mock Draft Central. I don't know if you guys remember that one. Um, the, the thing about that, though, is that sometimes at the end of the, the draft, people would – who cares? They just pick anyone. Uh, the NFBC, where you have a bit of money and skin in the game, is always the best source, right? If somebody is putting down 150 bucks, you know, I, I mean, one thing is 150 versus three thousand dollars. Obviously, one is more serious. But even if you have a little skin in the game, you're going to be very serious. Anything else to add, Ruvain? Yeah, I'd say even look at your teams from last year when you drafted. See what you did right. See what you did wrong. See what you can fix. See what you have to do again. That type of thing. Because a lot of times it's the method. And if you don't change your method to the way of, you know, to, to change it a little bit, if you're not doing well, then you're not going to do anything different this year. Also, you mentioned Fangraphs. On Fangraphs, there's a great uh, um, um, app that you can do. You can check the first half versus second half stats. See who did well in the first half. See who did poorly in the second half. See if there's any injuries that are related to it. And I think you're able to pick out who had a hot second half and who may carry it over or whose second half slump was just a fluke because of injury. Those are things to look at when you're actually comp compiling your own rankings. I'll add a few things onto that real quick, Ariel. Um, I think looking back at your teams from last year is really good advice, specifically for knowing what you did right, knowing what you did wrong. Some A big takeaway that I have on a lot of my Roto teams – from last year is batting average. Batting average is so hard to make up. And we heard actually out at first pitch Arizona that, you know, the the average batting average that you get off the waiver wire is something like 220. So you can't find batting average just openly, right? You have to draft it. And I think you have to draft it early. So that's something that I'm more cognizant of this year because I had teams with bad batting averages last year. I think you could also look at previous year's teams to find out what you should be targeting in terms of stats, right? Look at uh, how, how, how much, you know, the winner in the home run category needed the previous year or the stolen base category, so on and so forth, just to give you an idea of what to target uh, heading into this year. One other point on Fangraphs, their auction calculator is fantastic. And I, you guys have probably talked about it. Obviously, Ariel, everything that you do with the ATC projections. If you go to Fangraphs, you hover over their projections tab, there is a button that you could choose called Auction Calculator. And basically, you could run your entire league settings through that Auction Calculator, choose which projection system you want, and it will spit out a number. It'll spit out an auction value. And that tool is just so incredibly useful. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the first thing you should really do. Whatever your draft is, put it in the settings. Click ATC when ATC comes out as the uh, source. And uh, there you go. And you run it, and it gives you a nice ranking, a nice basis. And it actually tells you how much more valuable one player is versus the other. I wanted to ask you, Frank, have you changed the way that you prepare for a draft at all in the past couple of years? Or it's pretty much the same thing, uh, just you know, n new strategy for a year based on what's hot and what's not in the league? No, I mean, it's really just an evolution of things over the years, right? I mean, we can all remember starting up playing fantasy baseball. You know, back in college, I used to make handwritten positional rankings right and just kind of go based off that and you know since then it, it just evolves year over year i talked about this running google doc that i have with a bunch of notes on players but i've added new things in previous years where uh creating excel sheets and pulling all the relevant stats that i want to look at just all on one page right so i'll make these excel sheets for each position catcher first base second base so on and i'll have stats that I pull so it's easily accessible. I can see everything on one page for each position, right? It'll be stuff like average exit velocity, barrel rate, K percentage, stolen bases, just the things that I think are relevant. And, and that's something that I've added over the years, just talking to people and listening to people who are also really smart players and 
kind of figuring out where the game is trending in terms of like stats and analytics, what's useful, what's not, and just trying to incorporate those things more into my analysis. So again, creating those Excel sheets uh, per position with all the data. I got my running document with the notes. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously you have to change your strategy depending on the landscape, right? Whatever is going on in baseball. We know now that stolen bases are up. How does that affect your strategy? Well, some people will say uh, you don't need to overemphasize steals as much early on in your draft because they're more plentiful. You could find them, you know, more readily available throughout your draft. My argument would be is, okay, there's more stolen bases to go around. You also need more stolen bases to compete. So I'm still really cognizant of stolen bases and, and trying to get as many of them uh, early on as possible. But yeah, just kind of trying to figure out the landscape. Last year, pitching was kind of more un unpredictable than I think in years past because of all these new rules with the shift restrictions and uh, the stolen bases being up, offense being up in general around the league. Uh, as a result, pitching was more unpredictable. So, you know, I think in years past, the obvious answer is target pitchers who get strikeouts, right? You can mitigate risk um, on less balls in play. I think that's probably even more relevant or, you know, more right now than ever before, given the new rules. So again, it's just knowing what's happening in the game and kind of uh, shaping that into your strategy and the way things are trending in baseball. You just have to be aware of, of some of those rule changes and, and things that have changed over the past couple of years. That was so well said, Frank. Really, everything, I, I agree with everything that you said there. And it's it's really... Um, it is an evolution. It's it's not uh, it's not one thing at a time. You pick up a new bag of tricks every single year. Oh, I'm going to look at this more. Oh, I'm going to look at that more. You see what the environment changes year over year, and that's really the story. Anything to add, Ruvain? Yeah, I think you just have to continue just to grind like you always did. Just, most people don't do anything wrong in their prep. It's how they you know, go into the draft and prepare for the actual draft or prepare for the actual auction that people run into issues. They get distracted by a name instead of looking at the numbers. And then, yeah, that's that's what it comes down to. Just keep them, keep what you're doing because most of the time you're doing the correct way. You're preparing the correct way, but you're just not applying it correctly. Frank, there's a lot of players in, in the player pool, but obviously you're not, you're not going to want everyone. Um, do you prepare like a no draft list? Do not draft on this list, or do you prepare? I only want players from this list, or do you not do that? And obviously, you know you have your values in mind for every player, and you know if, if you get enough discount on one, you'll take them. Uh, but I, I, how do you operate? Do you do you do those don't, don't draft or do draft lists? I think that there are very few players that I will just straight up not draft, no matter what. There are some obvious players like Byron Buxton. I want absolutely nothing to do with. He can fall to pick 500. I'm not going to draft Byron <laughs> Buxton, right? It's just, he's been hurt. Uh, you know, he's not the same player that he once was. It's just, uh, Chris Bryant is another player like that, right? It's just, I get he's in Coors Field. The guy has not been able to stay healthy. It's, you know, he can fall and fall and fall. And I really will not be in inclined to want to take uh, someone like Chris Bryant. But uh, yeah, I think there are players that I will avoid at cost, right? You know, throughout the off season, I'll write two bust columns for CBS. And in fact, I'm working on my first one now. These will be players, uh, again, at their current cost, at their ADP that I am looking to avoid. Now, that doesn't mean avoid no matter what or that I just straight up don't like that player or I have a vendetta against your team because for some reason, fans of teams think that like whenever we write up a player as a bust, we, uh, we hate the Chicago Cubs or we hate the New York Mets. It, it has nothing to do with team fandom. It's obviously we're looking at you know the skills of a player and their draft cost. But say I write up, I don't know, for example, Ellie De La Cruz as a bust. He's a second round pick. Now, if everyone starts to feel that Ellie De La Cruz is a bust and he starts falling to the fourth or fifth round in drafts, then that's different. Obviously, that changes things. And so you got to be able to adapt. But again, it's just kind of an idea based on ADP uh, in most drafts. This is where a player is going. I will look to avoid a player at that cost. But again, it's not like a hard and fast rule. I have to avoid that player because I do think that every player has a price. Now, on the flip side, obviously, you're going to find players that you like as well. You know, I'll write up sleepers and breakouts articles this offseason as well. I mean, those will be the guys that I think are undervalued at their current ADP, the ones that can provide a profit. Ariel, I know this is something you and I have talked about sure. a lot in the past is even if it's not a massive profit, right? Even if you play in a deeper league and you, 
you, you draft a boring player at pick 250, a, a Lourdes Gurriel, and he goes out and hits 275 with 25 home runs, and you know he winds up being a, a $15 player. That's profit, right? And you're so I'm just looking at guys that are undervalued, or in the case of breakouts, those are really the players that I think okay, maybe this player can take a step forward and do something that we've never seen before. And every single year, there's going to be players that come out of nowhere and do things like that. And, you know, our job is to to try and look at some of the underlying skills and, and try and identify those players before it happens. So um, I guess that's a really long way of saying, yes, I do have players that I like to target. I'll look at, obviously, multiple th different things. But really, it always goes back to cost, Ariel, and ADP and whatever their, you know, their AAV might be in an auction. Uh, that really is where it starts. Um, and then you kind of form your opinion around a player based on where they're going in drafts. Yeah, that's really the way to do it. it it's all about your values versus the market. You know, in terms of not drafting a player, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't do that. I don't say I'm just not going to draft a player at all cost. I'll, I'll what's called risk-adjust a player. I'll say, well, I, I, you know, I don't like this player at cost. I love a $4 profit, but because this person has more risk factors, more than the average person, I'll need a $10 profit. So Byron Buxton, maybe he fooled even further, right? You need a tremendous uh, uh, pro uh, risk-adjusted profit. Uh, but I, I won't have a don't draft list uh, if that's the case. For this year, though, you know, I, I think m my weakness has been seeing projections on injured pitchers and saying, well, you know, if I buy him at this price, it's an $8 profit, $8 discount, I'll take a gamble. Maybe my threshold is too much. Um, you know, if, if there's a pitcher like uh, Jacob Degrom, I, I've I've had him uh, some shares of him over the last couple of years, even with the injury. And I said, well, it's, it's a ten dollar profit potential. Maybe I have to be a little bit more stringent and say, no, it's got to be a fifteen, eighteen dollar profit. Right, just increase that kind of threshold. Or maybe I just don't take that kind of gamble on higher price players. Maybe I say that, all right, to take a, a, a risky player, it's only a $1 to $6. Like I, I have just a threshold for what I consider a low-cost investment. Who cares? We can take a risk here and not take any risks up top. Uh, that, that's sort of what I think. Anything to add, Ruvain? Yeah, you mentioned Jacob Degrom. Every year we say, "Oh, yeah, he, we don't want we don't want him. We don't necessarily want him. He's not on our no draft list. But if he gets down to a certain price threshold, then we go. Then we can say, okay, we can consider him. And then when it comes time to an auction, you're sitting there and the price is that low. We look at each other like, is he worth the is he worth the risk? And we're like, you know, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Um, players, uh, you mentioned Byron Buxton. I, I I had him a couple of years ago. I, I got him like in the fifth round when he was going in the third round. I thought that's, you know, I'm willing to take a risk on a fifth round player, but you don't take a risk on a first or second round player. I don't think that's, I don't think it's the right, I don't think it's the right way to go. Um, and there's some years when we get players and I never thought we'd ever have him before. Like a couple of years, I had Jose Altuve. I'd never had him for many years before. I had, I had George Springer in the league last year. I never had him before. It's not the way I don't, not like he's on a, a non-draft, don't draft list, but it's just that it just doesn't work out that way. So you should never have a not draft list or an only draft list because then you pigeonhole yourself into a certain amount of players and it's harder to make a profit from the players you're drafting if you pigeon your holes, pigeonhole yourself like that. Yeah, so, you know, in terms of, talking about risk and incorporating risk into your your team frank do you subscribe to risk on an aggregation basis meaning um you won't draft more than two risky players like do do you try to limit the total amount of risk on your roster or do you say do you know what i'm just going to avoid risky players period or do you say you know what i can take three risky players but I've got to get lots and lots of profit on the three. Like, I, how do you deal with risk in terms of your team's roster construction? Yeah, I kind of look at it like a scale, right? Where if I take a risky player, let's just say Tyler Glass now, for example. I take Tyler Glass now in the third or fourth round, right? Obviously, he comes with a ton of risk and comes with a ton of upside. If I, for every Tyler Glass now I take, I feel like I need to supplement him with multiple high floor pitchers, right? And it's possible. You could do that. You can, the way that ADP works out right now, you can add a Logan Webb or a Framber Valdez or in the middle rounds, a Jordan Montgomery, a Jose Barrios. Some of these higher floor, I guess, quote unquote, boring pitchers, right? And so 
Look, if I take Tyler Glass now, I'm probably not taking like Chris Sale and Carlos Rodon. So to answer your question, I yeah, I don't think I could have like two or three incredibly risky pitchers on the same pitching staff. And, you know, I, I say risk probably associated more with injuries than anything else when it comes to pitchers, right? Like you talked about Jacob deGrom. In years past, if I took Jacob deGrom, there, like I, I wouldn't allow myself to take another, like another quote unquote injury risk later on in the draft. I would just, I would just feel like I'm taking on too much. So it's the same thing here. I, I do feel like there is profit potential for those players, but again, I don't want multiple of them. So, uh, like for where Chris Sale is going, I think it's pick 170 right now or 175. If he manages to stay healthy for 150 innings on the Atlanta Braves, there is huge profit potential. But again. I think that has to be surrounded by, you have to have a safer floor of pitching before you're ready to do that. Um, so for every risk I take, I kind of want to balance it out on the other side again with that scale of let me get maybe some higher floor, um, you know, innings eater type pitchers that I know can kind of supplement some of those uh, riskier starting pitchers as well. Right. So you are conscious of, of your team construct is what you're saying. Very, very yeah. conscious of it too. And even in rankings too. Uh, you know, I tweeted out my top 20 starting pitchers yesterday, and someone said, you're too low on Max Freed. That might be true. I think I have Max Freed at SP20 right now. But last year, he was dealing with a forearm injury that kept him out for multiple months, right? So that is in my mind. And, you know, I'm not, I don't have like a formula, Ariel, where I'm, all right, let me knock off this percentage of auction dollars. I'm kind of just doing it manually where if Max Freed was completely healthy, He's a borderline SP1. He's an ace. There's no doubt about that. He would probably be ranked as like a top 12 starting pitcher if we had no risk. But because I know, all right, in the back of my mind, he had that forearm injury last year. Let me knock him down a little bit. He's more of like a low-end SP2. And so uh, I'll try to bake risk into my rankings that way when you know when ranking starting pitchers. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Ruvain, I know you're conscious of that. Now, you're the injury guy, so... You know, what do you have to say about uh, all these injury uh, issues? I mean, we, we've taken together, we took Joe Musgrove last year. We, we, we've we taken, you know, lots of players with, with injury stuff, and uh, we, we continue to do it. I'm sort of talking myself out of taking so many risks. Like Tyler Glass now, I'm, I'm going to probably have a very high risk-adjusted uh, discount needed for him. You know, I, I just don't want to... I don't want to base my stats on on risk. I'd rather you know take less of a profit on a more sure thing. I don't, what, what, do you, what do you think we do for this year? Well, what I noticed last year and what we did last year was we tried to avoid pitchers or any any hitters coming into the season already injured. We didn't have a problem picking up or drafting players who were injured during spring training with minor injuries here and there. Like you mentioned the Joe Musgrove, he heard his toe during spring training. It's not like he had it beforehand. But other players, when they come into the season injury injured and they're already starting off on your roster injured and you don't know when they're going to come back. Oh, they'll come back end of April. Oh, they'll come back end of May. You don't know that. They don't know that. They're, they're, they, there's no way you could predict that. So I think if you want to go after the injury risk players, that's fine. But I would try to stick to the ones that, you know, are healthy coming into spring training. If they get dinged up in spring training, maybe you can get them at a discount, that type of thing. But then you also have to think about, are you going for the overall? Are you going for a league win? If you're going for overall, then your risks should be greater. I think there's no reason against that. Like you, you should, if you're going for the overall, take Tyler Glass now, though, because you want that upside because you're trying to win the whole league. But if you, a, a whole, you know, whole enchilada, everything. But if you're just trying to win like a smaller league or a satellite league, that type of thing, then taking those types of risks sort of play against that because you're not quote unquote playing it safe. You're being too risky and and it's it's not always worth it because you will lose value because you can get a, a big stack collector or someone who can get all the numbers you need in that spot instead of taking that high up high up end guy so frank we've talked a lot about year over year consistency and and how uh freddie freeman you know the fact that he's been at least a 25 dollar player for you know last seven years or so how that matters you know a lot and that says a lot about low risk players uh how much do you value year over year consistency when you're drafting yeah i think especially in the early rounds it's, it's something that I am definitely aware of, and it's something I would want in the players that I'm I'm drafting early on. I think it's it's a lot like risk in general. I think it's a sliding scale, right? Where 
at the top of your draft, you want to take on less risk, you want players who have been consistent year over year. And the further you go down the draft, that starts to, you know, that starts to go down a little bit, right? Like where by the time you get to the middle rounds, okay, I could take slightly more risk here. Uh, you know, I don't have to necessarily take a player that has done it, you know, three, four, five years in a row. Maybe it's someone who's only done it one once or twice, you know, something like that. So I think it's a sliding scale where, again, as you go down the draft, much like risk, um, the deeper you go, you could take on more risk. But again, up top, you want that foundation. And I think more often than not, the foundational pieces are going to be the ones that have provided that year-over-year -year consistency. The the Freddie Freemans, the Jose Ramirez is, Bryce Harper when he's been healthy, uh, Trey Turner, uh, you know, I guess years before last year, although he turned it on over the final two months. Uh, just guys like that that we've seen do it for, for so long. So we're talking first and second rounds today. So a guy like Ellie De La Cruz, I mean, he's only done it for half a year or so. Is that a kind of uh, inconsistent or just lack of experience that would say, I'm not taking him in the first three rounds? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, I guess, kind of foreshadowing. You had something on the rundown for, you know, which player are you avoiding in the first two rounds? And yeah. it would be Ellie De La Cruz, right? I mean, based sure. on everything that we're talking about, it wasn't even half of a season. He provided... You know, once he got called up in June, you know, he hit the ground running and he was awesome. But if you look at that second half, we're talking about a sub-200 batting average, you know, 35, 36% strikeout rate. He struggled against lefties. Now, mind you, I understand this is an incredibly fun player. So, you know, subjectively, we see him play and we're like, wow, he's awesome. I want that guy on my team. But if you look at fantasy baseball more from just – an objective point of view and that you're trying to make a profit on players or at least early in rounds, like you're trying to get as much return on investment as possible. Ellie De La Cruz is a player that you probably should not be taking in the first two rounds of drafts. Well, let's talk um, Corbin Carroll first for a small second here because he's done, I mean, he was fantastic last year, but he's only done it, you know, one time. He's going pick number four on average, according to the NFBC ADP. Do you, what what is the case for and case against Carroll? Uh, because, well, there's a little bit of an injury concern with Carroll, right? Just a little bit with the shoulder and all that. Um, he's very little experience, but obviously there's tremendous upside, and he, you know, his his ceiling is obviously a top, you know, four pick. Uh, what, what what's your take on on where he's going right now, and you know, which which side of the case do you really see more? Are you inside of my head right now, Ariel? Because <laughs> <laughs> Corbin Carroll is the other name that I had along with Ellie uh, De La Cruz as uh, the one at cost right now that I won't be drafting. And, you know, I I have him more as like a later first round pick because I do want to acknowledge the upside. He just showed us what he could do um, this past season. Unanimous rookie of the year, 25 homers, 54 steals with a good batting average. I mean, that kind of skill set is really rare. I mean, you're not really going to find that anywhere outside of the first round. So I want to acknowledge that. But I do think Corbin Carroll is one of the riskiest first-round picks right now uh, for the reasons you mentioned. I mean, he has a history of shoulder injuries. He had a few scares in 2023. Most notably, you remember he, he took a swing. He dropped the bat immediately and started holding his shoulder. I actually have a quote written down here. Uh, right after that happened, I took a swing and I felt a shift in my shoulder. Shocking, tingling sensation go down my arm, and then my hand went numb. I was just holding it, thinking it came out of the socket, pretty much thought that the season was over. He was in the lineup the next day. So <laughs> I don't really know how you explain something yeah. like that, but those, the, the, you know, the shoulder that we saw last year, he had labrum surgery on that, that shoulder a couple of years ago as well. There's a lot of risk involved there. So, again, that's just risk-reward. The reward is massive, but give me other players in the first round that maybe they don't have the same upside. I'll take a Mookie Betts over him. I'll take a Freddie Freeman over him. I'll take Kyle Tucker over him. Uh, just because we've seen those guys do it more years in a row and no injury concerns with any of those guys. Totally agree. Ruvain as well? 
Yeah, so I think that where Corbin Carroll is going right now, I don't think I, I want to take him there. I, I don't think I'm going to get the value for him. I don't think I'm going to get the value for an Ellie De La Cruz and where he's going. If you're picking someone in the first two rounds, rounds one or two, you're expecting them to get either first-round value or second-round value or more. If you're picking Corbin Carroll in pick four and pick five, if you think he's going to go number one in the draft next year because he's going to exceed expectations, then fine, go ahead, pick him at that at that spot. But if you don't, if you if you're not going to do that, then why are you taking taking him? Take someone like a Freddie Freeman, like a Jose Ramirez, who I see their picture in my head and I hear Homer Simpson saying boring. And you know what? Sometimes boring is good. Yeah. The only thing I'd add for his case is the uniqueness of the profile. And, you know, my next question, of course, uh, uh, to, to you, Frank, is, you know, what are you what are you trying to accomplish most with a first and second round draft pick? And I think that, you um, the fact that he can he can be like a thirty sixty like almost Acuna type numbers, that adds to me wanting to pick him. Like if if the up if it was just thirty thirty upside, okay, you can bank stats. To me, he's not even a first rounder, but that's such an upside that that really really does it. But before we go any further, it's time for the injury gurus trivia of the week. So I was looking at the current ADP and where it stands, and I'm, you know, a little bit intrigued by some of the names that are on there. And I look back at last year's ADP from the TGFBI contest from 2023, from last year, the first two rounds. So I compared this year's first two rounds and last year's first two rounds. My question to you guys is this. How many players were there in the first two rounds last year that are not in the first two rounds this year? And could you name them? In the first two rounds last, last year, year, not, not in the this first year. two rounds B- this Bichette? year. Bichette? Bichette. Bo Bichette, yes. He's going around number 40 right now. Vlad Jr.? Vlad Jr., he fell also. Think injuries. Was Think Jacob DeGrom injuries. a top two-round pick? He was not. No, not that. No, he was not. But Edwin Diaz was in, uh, TGF, in TGFBI. Mike Trout was. Real Muto? Real Muto was in the first two rounds also. Paul Goldschmidt, Manny Machado, Sandy Alcantara. And in, at the end of the first round, at the end of the second round last year, Michael Harris the second was actually going at the end of the second round last year. So that's nine, nine players. Nine players who were in the first two rounds last year that are not this year. So my question to you, Frank, is this. What's changed from this year to last year, and what are you trying to do in the first two rounds? Are you trying to get certain stats or a certain type of player? I think it's just banking stats in general, trying to build that foundation like we talked about earlier. Ideally, I would love for it to be power and speed with both of the of your first two picks, but the way that ADP is kind of shaping up right now, the first round is filled with a bunch of players that provide both power and speed. The second round, not as much. Uh, it's guys that are very proven, but we're talking about a lot of four category or even elite three category producers, right? So looking at names like Yoran Alvarez or Corey Seager, Austin Riley, uh, Matt Olson, Pete Alonzo, uh, Rafael Devers, right? There's lots of names like that going in the second round of drafts this year, which I would be fine with. Again, those those guys are incredibly proven. You know, for me, I, I'd like to target the batting average as well. I n- mentioned that's something that I'm more cognizant of. I really want to build that batting average up with my first two hitters if possible. Uh, but yeah, it's batting average and just bankable stats, whether or not it doesn't necessarily have to be speed. I would like for it to be speed. But even getting someone like Austin Riley, I, I think he's incredibly safe, and I would probably project 30 to 35 home runs, you know, 200 runs plus RBI with a serviceable batting average, right? 270 plus batting average. So even a player like that is incredibly valuable, even though he's not providing the speed. Yeah, um, I agree with most of what you said there. I mean, you obviously want to grab guys who are good in every category as much as you can, and yes, they are concentrated in the first round. Uh, it's the uniqueness of profile for me, stuff that you just can't get anywhere else um, really quickly. Uh, bankable stats that uh, you can be certain of. I mean, Trey Turner right now, and he's going ADP 10. I mean, Trey Turner has banked at least a $25 player in the last six years in a row. Him and Freddie Freeman are the only two guys to do that. Uh, so, you know, you want bankable stats, and he does provide some uniqueness with the steal, stolen bases and some of the average. To me, that's a very interesting person to to get. Um, 
you know, uh, you also want guys who have been consistent year over year. I, I don't like taking rookies in the first round I, I or second round in general uh, because you just – you hope – you hope what they can be, but you don't know what they're going to get. So a lot of things to deal with. Uh, you do not have to overextend any stat. Stolen bases, you don't have to push it. If the value that you get from the stolen bases dictates that he's, that he's you know not worth as much, and you say, well, no, no, we got to push it for steals, don't have to do that this year. Stolen bases, there are so many more in baseball that you can find them here and there. Yes, you do need more, but unless we're talking about a very unique profile, you don't have to bank the stats. You can bank them along the way, get the biggest bank for your buck early on. I tend to agree with that. Um, I think it's also very important to get a lot of power in the first two rounds. Speed you can get elsewhere. I'm all, I've always been a big proponent not to go for speed in the first two rounds because you can get it later in the draft. I've always said that. It's more so true this year. So I think power is good. And you know what? I don't necessarily love the pitchers where they're going either right now. So I think it's no problem going power, power, who throw in a couple steals. I mean, how many stolen bases did Freddie Freeman have last year? You don't think of him as a stolen base guy. Jose Ramirez, he gets a whole bunch of stolen bases. Trey Turner, obviously, he'll get you the stolen bases, but his power has been going up. Um, that's, that's what I'm looking for. You're looking for that base. You need that base so you can take risks later on in the draft um frank what is your take on drafting an ace starting pitcher in the first two maybe three rounds do you feel that you have to walk away in the first couple of rounds with a starting pitcher because of all the uncertainty in pitching or do you feel that no you know what i want to get the sure things of the hitters those first three round hitters are just such sure things it's got a good track record of of repeating Pitching is fickle anyways. We'll just deal with quantity over quality, and we'll, you know we'll draft our first starting pitcher in rounds four to six. What's your take on starting pitching? Uh, I never think that there's one specific way, right? I don't think that you have to have a starting pitcher in the first two rounds. You know, I've seen you know people win main event leagues and and compete in main event overall titles waiting till the fifth or sixth round to draft starting pitchers. Obviously, you have to hit on those pitchers and you have to draft the right ones. Uh, this year in particular, I agree with Ruvain. I don't necessarily love the cost uh, for some of the pitchers going in the first two rounds. You know, Spencer Strider, as amazing as he is, all the strikeouts that he's going to give you, he still had an ERA approaching four. Is that going to be the same in 2024? I'm not so sure. But again, there are risks. I think there are more inherent risks with starting pitchers in the early rounds. So I do like targeting hitters. And I'm in a draft right now where I started with three hitters. And then I went three pitchers in rounds four, five, and six. I took Freddie Peralta, Logan Webb, and Kyle Bradish. And I'm fine with that. I, I, I think that's a totally fine start to your pitching staff. And again, I don't think there's any one right way or wrong way to draft. I, I know people that do pocket aces and it works out well for them. If you do something like that, you're probably just going to you know draft as many hitters in the middle rounds as you possibly can. But me personally, this year, I think I'm more likely to take hitters in the first two rounds Maybe a pitcher in the third. There are some names I like in that area. A Pablo Lopez, a George Kirby, maybe a Yamamoto, someone like that. Uh, but really, it's you know rounds four, five, six, seven that I have really been targeting starting pitchers, and I, I like the, the names that are going there right now. So, so how far does Spencer Strider have to fall in the first round for you to say, how can I pass up Spencer Strider? I think if we're talking about a 15-team league, it's probably towards the back end of the first round uh i think they're like the top 10 or 12 hitters or so i mean we can look at you know the kyle tuckers uh fernando tatis is kind of like in a category of his own he does provide power and speed but there are risks there as well uh trey turner freddie freeman even like judge and soto jose ramirez bryce harper i really like those names so i i think he would probably have to fall towards the back end of the first round in a 15 team league but I know there's some people that will listen to that and, and think I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, they want to get as many uh, strikeouts as possible early on in the draft. So uh, for me, it's probably a late first round pick. No, it's good, good to, to help uh, get a feeling as to, you know, how, how far the button you can press until you say, well, I got to grab those 200 strikeouts, which, by the way, his profile is very unique. You know, I brought him up because there's not many people who do that. I am concerned about him personally, though, in terms of the ERA. I mean, we saw a couple of months somewhere in the middle of the season where, you know, he was just giving up runs and runs and runs. I don't think his ERA is really it, – it won't for sure be that impressive. Right? I think the win total will be there, strikeouts, but 
the ERA could be a, a problem. So I'm not I'm not for I have to pick Spencer Strider, but yeah, I, I'd say for me, you know, back end of of first round of fifteen team league. Ruvena, where are you with that? Uh, with him, um, I went on a whole tirade on him when we were in Arizona. How I'm re- I'm ready for Spencer Strider to actually collapse. I'm a little nervous taking him. I would take him toward the end of the first round, but I'm a little nervous because remember. In 2022, he pitched 131 innings. Last year, he pitched 186 plus innings plus playoffs. He was hurt at the end of the year. He they, had, they skipped him a couple of starts. His ERA ballooned in the second half of the year because we had him on, a, on our on our NFBC team. His, his ERA ballooned. I, I, I even thinking about sitting him for a while because he just he was getting the strikeouts, but he was killing everything else. And he wasn't even going five innings, which was a problem. Um, I, I'm I'm nervous about him. He's a, he's young. He hasn't had. He's 25 years old. He hasn't had an elbow injury yet. And a pitcher who's young who just throw 180 innings gets as many strikes as and throws as many pitches. As he does i'm getting a little nervous about him i'm not saying there's anything wrong with him but you know when you're talking about risk that's a risk you're gonna you have to think about taking remember he's a pitcher who did not has not gotten hurt same thing with you want to mention yamamoto he's going later but he also he's he's thrown a lot of innings he's coming over from japan coming to the united states going from maybe from six every six days to every five days it's a question of whether you want to take that risk and yes spencer strider is the unique you know, unicorn of pitchers in in this draft. I, I mean, the safe one is Garrett Cole, but if uh, as safe as you're going to be, but he's the unique one. If you want to take that risk, that's fine. But I'm a little hesitant just because of what I mentioned. All right, so let's get into who we think is overvalued, undervalued within the first two rounds. So we've mentioned a couple names already. Uh, maybe you throw in another one as well. But Frank, who is a player in being drafted in the first two rounds that for you is overvalued? Yeah, so we spoke about Corbin Carroll right now, has an ADP of fourth overall uh, for the reasons we mentioned. Look, it's an awesome skill set, no doubt, but I I do have some concerns about the shoulder while acknowledging he can make me look foolish for for fading him this season. Uh, Ellie De La Cruz is the other one. He's going in the middle of the second round. He's a tantalizing player. There's huge upside. He is someone that can go, you know, 30, 60. I mean, he can... Maybe not do exactly what Acuna did. I don't think anyone could do that. But like, just in terms of that raw power and speed, Ellie De La Cruz has it. It also could come with like a li- really low batting average. I think there's actually risk where if he really struggles, he could be even back in the minors, which some people might not want to hear. But again, you, you have to think about the ranges of outcomes with, with all these players. The only other player, maybe Gunnar Henderson. I see he's the last pick in the second round. I understand why it's... Similar to Corbin Carroll, he was ranked as the top prospect coming into the year. He got off to a really slow start. Uh, but over the final four months, he was a borderline elite player. You know, the batting average was up over 270 in the final two months. Gives you power, uh, some speed. He's in a really good lineup. So I I get why people like Gunnar Henderson. But again, it's just that lack of a track record. And, you know, he, you got to pay the price. <laughs> it's a second-round pick for, for Gunnar Henderson. Uh, I probably won't have him on many teams if if he stays there in ADP. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, to to your point about Ellie De La Cruz, if you have to think that there's somewhat of a possibility where the guy is going to end up in the minors somewhere in the year, you should not be drafting him in the first two rounds. I mean, any doubt as to whether a guy will stay in the majors all year, you can't draft him in the first two rounds, right? Not for me. (laughs) Nope. Ruben, how about you? Who's a player who do you find who's overvalued in the first two rounds. Well, I mentioned Spencer Strider already. I think he's a little bit overvalued, and we mentioned Ellie De Cruz already, but the guy who's going right after Ellie De, Ellie De Cruz, Ozzy Albies, I mean, I'm looking at the guys who are going after him. I think I may want those guys before I take Ozzy Albies. Yes, I understand position scarcity. You want to go through that whole, you know, bowl yarn with the middle infield and everything like that. But I, you know, I don't see Ozzy Albies. Ozzy Albies is a top second baseman. I, there's no doubt about it. But if you look at the guys going after him, Lindor had a better year than him last year. Devers is a little bit more consistent than he is. The pitchers, you want to take a Burns or a Wheeler or a Gaussman after him, that's fine. Alonzo, I'm more comfortable with the home runs. Simeon, they're, it's comparable to Albies. So I think I'd be taking Albies toward the end of the second round or beginning of the third round as opposed to where he's going here. I'll throw in one. Uh, Francisco Lindor. Um I never thought he was fantastic at, at, in fantasy. Uh, he had a great year last uh, last year, no doubt, and he plays for our Mets, so I, I have to enjoy that, of course. Um, but uh, middle infield is a deep position, and it's also a wide position. 
Batman. A little bit uh, about the difference between the two. Deep position to me is where you start out at the top of the draft, and there's just so many people that are acceptable as a top tier, and it goes down and down and down. But wide is where at the bottom – there's just a lot of people at the end of the draft. Like you could be comfortable with any one of you know some ten, one to five dollar players. Like it, it's both deep in the top and wide at the bottom. And middle infield has it's just getting more and more acceptable there. Like we we used to say, oh middle infielders, um, you know you got to get one. It's scarce. It's the opposite. There's more middle infielders than there are corner infielders that are viable for fantasy. Um, I don't think that um, Lindor has to be pushed at this that this. Uh, part, I think that he's not as unique as you think, and to me, he's he's uh, he can turn into a 255 hitter at any time. He's done it before. Uh, he's had launch angle problems. Um, you know, the Mets also don't run a lot. He could stop running at any point if the management said, you know what, forget about running. The Mets could also be terrible this year. Uh, I hope not, but if they are, that means that their run production will be low, so the the RBIs and runs won't be there, and you need that to be in the top two rounds to be high. So I have serious doubts that Lindor will end up in the first two rounds, and so I would not pick him myself there. So far, so good, everyone? Yep, yep. I, I agree with that. All right, who is a player in the first two rounds that is currently even undervalued at the position that they are? Frank? So we say it every year, Ariel. <laughs> I'm sure you will agree with this as well. Uh, Freddie Freeman kind of feels like Freddie Freeman should be a top five player. He's not incredibly undervalued. He's ninth overall in ADP right now. Not sure what else he has to do. I mean, he even added a new wrinkle to his game. 23 stolen bases last year. Not sure that he'll repeat that. I'd probably expect somewhere around 15, but in that lineup with Otani, I mean, the counting stats could just be so ridiculous. You're getting one of the best batting averages in baseball with 25-plus home runs. So I think Freddie Freeman should be a top-five pick. It feels like he is a little bit undervalued. Two names towards the end of the first round, Jose Ramirez and Bryce Harper. Jose Ramirez, I, I know the counting stats were down last year. Not that the Guardians lineup looks like it's going to be much better, but... There are some prospects on the way. Kyle Manzardo, Chase DeLauder. I think that those can help the Guardians lineup in 2024. Counting stats are also kind of fluky too, right? You look year over year. Just a year prior, Jose Ramirez had well over 100 RBI. Um, normally, it's the player who controls that. If, if Jose Ramirez just does Jose Ramirez things, he's going to come close to 100 runs, 100 RBI. Uh, so I would expect counting stats to bounce back a little bit. And plus, he still provides that power and speed. Bryce Harper, uh, he got off to the slow start last year coming back from the elbow injury. Final two months, he was Bryce Harper and then some. Uh, he's a first baseman who's going to give you a good batting average, 30-plus home runs, counting stats, and probably going to chip in 10 to 15 steals as well. So uh, for me, it's Freeman, Jose Ramirez, uh, and Bryce Harper. Yep, good choices. What about you, Ruvain? Anybody to add? Yeah, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say two Yankees. Um, last year... Aaron Judge was going in the top five most of the time, even six, something like that. He got hurt last year. He only had a total of 367 at-bats last year. He still hit 37 home runs. He Supposedly, his foot's good and he's healthy. If he's healthy, why is he going later this year than he's going last year? I don't get it. He's going he's to be in a better lineup. So I don't see why he's going there. And also... We always mention Juan Soto. I mean, every year we do. Juan Soto, he, I mentioned before already, he's in a contract year. He's playing in the in the, for the short porch with the Yankee Stadium. I mean, everyone always says that. They said that with, with Anthony Rizzo when he came over. But this is, this is we're talking about Juan Soto, who's, quote, unquote, a generational talent. Um, I, I, he can be a top three fantasy player by the end of this year. He's not going to have as many stolen bases as the, as the other guys will, but his batting average will still be there. He's He gets on base like, an, like, an, like a demon, and if he's batting either before or after Aaron Judge, his value is not represented in where he's drafting right now. I'll throw in two other names. Um, Matt Olson and Jordan Alvarez, in, in particularly, I think, Olsen. Um, they're not that many players that have 50 home run upside. Again, it's a little bit about uniqueness, and I don't care as much that they don't steal. I understand that. We, we talked about that earlier. But 50 homer upside, Olsen and Alvarez. And the thing about Olsen is um, the RBIs and runs, they're going to be there. That Brave lineup is tremendous. So you have a guarantee of close to 40 with upside of 50 homers, with bankable 100 RBIs and runs, 
with going to be good average also. I mean, this is such a lock. It, it, it almost reminds me of Nolan Arenado a few years ago where he always slipped further than he should because he didn't steal. But to me, he's still going to bank that value. So uh, I like those two guys just a little bit earlier than where they're going. What about a player who is not being drafted right now in the first two rounds but should be? What about you, Frank? So I I do think that the first round the first two rounds are pretty efficient so far. Uh, I actually did an exercise on the Fantasy Baseball Today podcast looking at the first round from last year's ADP and seeing where they finished and the market was basically spot on. Did a great job uh you know predicting the first round last year. So far this year I think it's pretty efficient as well. One name that I think could sneak into the second round and maybe deserves it is Jose Altuve who last year Still had 17 homers, 14 steals in only 90 games played. We know he missed time to start the year because he suffered the broken bone uh, during the World Baseball Classic. Obviously, it was you know a fluke injury, uh, but still providing that batting average. Has hit 300 or better two years in a row. Power and speed. Not going to give you RBI because he leads off, but Astros lineup should be really, really good once again. It kind of feels to me like Altuve is a borderline you know top two-round player. I'll throw in uh, Bo Bichette and Michael Harris. Bo Bichette, I mean, just in the last two years, he was, you know, first-round pick. And, and wasn't he, uh, like, a top-five pick a couple of years ago? Um, his stolen bases have fallen off. I think he was slightly injured. He had, like, a quad strain, right, and, and he had some issues with his leg. So um, if that's the story, and back to stolen bases, and we don't know what he's going to do in this era. He only had five last year. I mean, that, that could be incredible. He batted 306 last year, um, 20 homers. That can go a little bit up. Like, I, I can see the case that his value can propel him more. And uh, Michael Harris, well, I mean, I just finished telling you about how awesome that Braves lineup is. This is a bankable, uh, bankable RBIs and runs. And I think Harris really has tremendous power-speed combo. Um, I like the uniqueness of his profile. I like the floor. Uh, there was a case for him last year, and I think even more so this year as he matures with age. So I think those guys could sneak, for me, into uh, the second round. Ruvain, anyone? Well, you stole my Bo Bichette because I, I wanted to say Bo Bichette. Bo Bichette last year, he dealt with a couple injuries. He had a thumb, a knee, and a quad injury. Now, the reason why he wasn't a top two round value last year because his stolen bases were down but he still batted over 300 he still hit 20 home runs and he still did have a handful of stolen bases so he still has that upside he's only 25 years old and he's still in a very he's in a very good lineup so that's one guy and another guy who i was shocked that and i have to give props to um um uh what's his name the guy from uh a a baseball hq the injury guy um matt H matt heaterstrom he drafted adelise garcia in the second round last year. He, I think he got second round value from him last year. He's Adelis Garcia, he is a unique profile. He can hit 40 home runs. He can hit 45 home runs. His batting average is not that great. He'll throw in maybe five to 10 stolen bases, but he's a guy who can earn second round value and you can probably get him in the third or fourth round. Just to finish off this uh, discussion, um, is anybody not have Ronald Acuna as their number one overall pick? <laughs> No, <laughs> I think no. it's impossible. <laughs> I mean, his ADP this year might be 1.001. .001. Like some some idiot will, will will say, you know what? I'm gonna screw up the the perfect score for him. Has that ever has that ever happened before? No, that's never happened. Not this even is, with Albert Pujols back in the day. You know when Pujols was really good when he was La Machine. Pujols was the closest. This this was like 15, you know, 15, 20 years ago almost. He was he was the closest to this, uh, where it was pretty much consensus. But uh, it's incredible. And and if you look at the projections, it would, no matter what, uh, I was talking uh, yesterday on Twitter with uh, Jeff Erickson and uh, back and forth that, you know, there's like a 15 to $20 difference in projections between Acuna and the next person. Like if, if you're doing a KDS, uh, I know that I, I, I've always advocated pick in the middle, it's better. I mean, but the case is, if you don't pick number one, you're losing out on a, such a tremendous bankable value. Uh, is anybody here not picking KDS1 and saying, eh, I'll try the back end? No, I mean, if it were up to me, I, I would love to have the first overall pick. And it's really regardless of format, too. It, it does not matter. Roto, head-to-head -head points, head-to-head -head categories. Uh, Acuna, far and away the number one player. Uh, I, look, you shouldn't bank on a repeat from last year, but like you said, the projections, 
Ariel, I've never seen anything like this. You know, running the steamer projections through the auction calculator, right now Acuna is coming up as like an almost a $60 player in a 12-team league. I've never seen anything like that. No, this is definitely a first. I mean, uh, I have Acuna at 56, um, you know, Freeman 37. We're talking like, you know, $19 difference between everybody. Yeah. Just absolutely, absolutely insane. Um, but that's what it is. Uh, that's what it is this year. Now, do we think that he's going to be the number one overall at the end of the year? Um, I don't know. It, 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 it's hard to bet on such a repeat. I think that betting on him to end up in the first round, that's a pretty good shot. Uh, but it's crazy. Hey, uh, does anybody have a good uh, number two overall? Like, what, 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 Frank, what, what's your, who's your number two this year? I think after Acuna, there's like this mini tier of two players in a Roto League, and it's Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Witt, just because the power speed contributions that those two can provide, along with a batting average that doesn't hurt you, uh, and also they're young players and they're still ascending. You know, Julio Rodriguez, I think he legitimately has 40 40 potential with a 280 plus batting average. Uh, and then with Bobby Witt, uh, you know, another one where I think he could hit 280 plus, his expected batting average was around 300, according to StatCast. So maybe even room for him to get even better. And he was one stolen base off from going 30 50 last year. So I know you guys want the power, but man, to get that speed along with, uh, you know, 30 plus home runs, I think it's. For me, it's a pretty obvious two and three of Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Witt. I'm a little bit lower on Witt. I mean, not far lower, but I think being in the Kansas City Royals lineup, the runs and RBIs won't be as much. Like, I think I'd rather go with Betts or Tucker uh, or Freeman even uh, over than Witt. I mean, I think maybe Witt is my number six pick, uh, but uh, I have him a little bit lower. What about you, Ruvain? I have Jay Rod at second. I think he actually still has some upside, believe it or not. I don't think we saw the the true um, Julio Rodriguez last year. I think he's a, a solid number two pick. And I am I happen to agree with you, Ariel. Um, I like Mookie Betts at number three here, just because consistency. He's quote unquote the the boringest of the top players, I guess, because he has not that much upside. Because we know what his upside is going to be. Plus, he's second base eligible, which is very good. It's always good to have a um, guy you can move around like that. I like Bobby Witt at four, though. I do like that. And I probably put Kyle Tucker before Corbin Carroll. Then I may go Corbin Carroll at six. Do a very, very quick mailbag here. Not that many questions uh, today. Um, Ariel, uh, this is from Justin. He says, Ariel, is your annual Game Theory article in the works this year? It's one of my favorite reads. Well, thank you very much, Justin. The answer is yes. It will be out in a couple of weeks. Okay. And nobody has to answer that question other than me. Um, how about... Uh, Scotty Barnes, ask Frank for his not on my team list of players he wants no part of. Well, we sort of discussed earlier that we don't really have that exactly, right? Yeah, not not exactly. And again, I, I'm in the process of I'm writing a, a bus article that's going to come out. It's it's free. It'll be open to the public. So I would you know recommend checking that out. It'll be out on either Monday or Tuesday. Um, I don't know when this podcast is going to come out, but uh, yeah, mid January. My bus column will be out, and then I'll have a, a bus 2.0, which will come out later in the offseason. And, and again, those are just the players I'll be looking to avoid at their cost. So I, I, I'd say, uh, you know, pay attention for that and, and kind of just read it when, it when once it comes out. And final question, Colt says, 12-team uh, head-to-head category OBP league, five keepers picking last after winning the title. Which five of these should I keep? Wit in the first round, Altuve seventh, Michael Harris in the 11th, Vlad in the 17th, Adley in the 19th, Ellie in the 20th, Jordan in the 21st. I mean, if I understand this correctly, you get those guys in those rounds. The answer is just those the last five. Like, Wit in the first round doesn't provide you extra value. Jordan in the, 21st val- in the 21st round provides you a ridiculous amount of value. So even though you might like Wit over Jordan, the 21-round difference, it says it all. The answer is the last five. Anybody disagree? Yeah, 100%. I mean, look, if, if it's a huge difference in talent, then I would, you know, maybe um, look at it differently. But again, I mean, these are like borderline first round players that you're getting, you know, outside the top 10 rounds. So, yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Ruben? No, no question. No question. Ruben, any uh, injuries? First two round injuries to talk about? 
Yes, well, we mentioned Francisco Lindor. Lindor had surgery to remove a bone spur in his right elbow. He was supposed, supp supposedly, he's been dealing with it and he dealt with it from spring training and throughout the entire season. So he was playing and he had a great season with a bone spur in his elbow. Um, we, I mentioned Manny Machado, who didn't make the top two rounds this year. He had elbow surgery to repair an extensor tendon in his right elbow. It just came out recently that he may not be ready to play defense opening day. Hmm. That makes you think whether or not you want to draft him as early as he's going because he may be able to DH. How effective is he going to be when he DHs? I don't know how that's going to work out. You mentioned Byron Buxton. Um, Byron Buxton had a knee surgery. They mentioned today, or early, actually early this week, that he is going to be the opening day center fielder and he's going to be playing seven center field for basically as much as they can as, as, as long the, as he will go. Third inning, this though. is the quote from... The man, Rocco Bodelli, we're going to go into spring training, planning on, if everything continues to go well, having him out there in center field and very hopeful that the procedure he had, that he had knee surgery, puts him in the spot that he needs to be in. But we also have a plan for everything as usual. So, yeah, so draft Byron Buxton where you want to. And another thing I want to mention, there's no injury on him right now, but I do want to say that Zach Wheeler, the last two spring trainings, dealt with shoulder soreness, dealt with some back soreness. If you hear this, don't be overly alarmed because his ADP did drop a little when those news reports came out during spring training. If those do come out and if something like that comes out and you see he drops to the third round or fourth round, grab him. Frank, this was a fantastic show. I uh, really want to thank you so much for coming on. I think we had a fantastic discussion on uh, deep dive into uh, risk and, and in terms of strategy and first, second round. So thank you so much for coming on. And why don't you tell the audience uh, where we can see your stuff, uh, we can watch you and uh, read you and all things Frank Stample. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Ariel. You can follow me on Twitter, X, not sure what to call it anymore, at Roto underscore Frank. You can listen to me on the Fantasy Baseball Today podcast, and you can find a bunch of other work of mine over at cbssports.com slash fantasybaseball. You'll be able to find my rankings. Those are coming out um, on Monday. Again, this is like mid-January for whenever people are listening to it. I'm going to have uh, articles coming out, sleepers, breakouts, and busts all throughout the offseason. The the co the podcast is going to go to four times per week in February, five times per week in March. And then we're doing in-season pods uh, every weeknight in the regular season as well. So, again, you can find all my work over there. And I appreciate you guys having me on. Ariel, we got to get together, man. We got to get a pickle pickleball game going because I've improved a lot since the last time we played. So I just oh, nice. want to throw that out there. I want to throw uh, it out there. Absolutely. We'll definitely do pickleball <laughs> soon. Uh, great game for all those who uh, want to play. And, by the way, you guys do have to listen to the CBS show. Uh, Frank is the best host in the game, uh, in the industry here. Uh, the show is fantastic. Gets you all the players' information and discussion um, with uh, Chris and Scott is phenomenal. So, uh, it, it, and it's pretty much daily. Uh, it's going to be daily uh, when the uh, year starts. Um, just a couple times a week right now. Uh, Got to listen to it. So uh, that's my plug there, uh, and I really do mean it. I do listen to the show as well. Uh, Ruvain, what about you? You can follow me on X or Twitter at MLB Injury Guru, where I tweet out injury updates as they come. More should start coming in when pitchers and catchers start to report the camp in about a month or so. You'll hear more about what's going on because they they don't have to teams don't have to report any injuries at this point. They only report them when they start coming in. And you can also catch my weekly in season article on Roto Bowler. It comes out every week to help you manage your fab for that week. And I'm Ariel Cohen. I'm over at Fangraphs, over at Roto Bowler. ATC projections coming out. In about a week, stay tuned for that. You can follow me on Twitter at ATCNY. If you want updates on the ATC projections, you can follow at ATC projections. So follow that. Also follow this show. Uh, we're at beat underscore shift underscore pod. F uh, keep up to date on all the stuff, mailbag and everything. So give us a follow as well. Once again, thank you so much to Frank Stample for coming on the show. And from all of us here at Beat the Shift, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Shift podcast presented by Fangress. Follow us on Twitter at beat underscore shift underscore pod.